that we all need to be nourished spiritually? Our life is a, is a journey, and it's a journey from the moment we're in the womb of our mothers, a journey from our birth to that weakness of birth, and to all our life until there's the weakness of our elderness, and then eventually our death. So our whole life is a question of growth, gradual growth, and it's a growth from ignorance to understanding. It's a growth in openness to the world. We begin quite closed with mum, and then it's the gradual opening of our, of our lives. And so for all this uh, movement, what do we need? <laughs> we need to eat, we need to drink, we need food. You see, food and drink is something about life. In order to live, we need energy, we need, we need the water. But also we need food because we have to move from selfishness to self-giving. And the whole movement of the Spirit of God, the whole movement of Jesus is calling us to love more to be more compassionate, to be more forgiving. Because we know we're in a world of competition and rivalry and we close ourselves up and very quickly we can go into struggle to show I am right and you are wrong. And so we need some energy which will permit me to move from that energy of selfishness to an energy of, of giving. Today we're going to be near the Lake of Galilee, and it's April. It's springtime. We hear just near the feast of the Passover. Thousands of wildflowers all over the place. It's incredibly beautiful. It's springtime for Jesus. Many people are beginning to come to him because they have been healed. They've seen Jesus as a healer. And so they're all following him, possibly bringing people with disabilities, people who are sick. And it's springtime for the, for the disciples. They had left their family, maybe criticized, uh, in order to follow the one they thought was the Messiah. But now they're beginning to see it works. People are beginning to follow Jesus. They're coming. And so they're going to be part of the government of Jesus in this liberation of, of, of Israel. And so there's, there's excitement in the air. And Jesus walks up the mountain, sits down, and he sees this huge crowd following him. And somewhere his heart is touched. And then Andrew sees a little guy, a little boy, who's got five little pieces of loaves and two fish. And uh, so it's, it's beautiful how Jesus uses little people, like the servants at Cana. Here it's a little boy. And Andrew says, what's, what's this? This is ridiculous. So Jesus, acting rather like a, a host at a big party, says, let everybody sit down. And we are here that 5,000 families, and you can see them all on this beautiful hill looking down over the lake. And then Jesus tells the disciples to give out the food and the fish. And it's said that everybody had enough to eat. The sun is shining, it's a beautiful day, there are the flowers, they're having enough to eat and, and, uh, and uh, fish, and so there's a sense of a little miracle of community. They, they've come together and they're eating and they're chatting and Jesus is going from group to group and you just sense that it's a glorious day, a heavenly day. And I'd like to come back to this question of the, of the miracle. I think many of us, we have difficulties with miracles and I can really understand. And to tell you the truth, uh, Jesus himself doesn't like doing miracles because miracles equates with power. And we know that Jesus isn't there to show power. But for myself, miracle or no miracle, it doesn't touch me in any way. The Gospel says so is a miracle, and in a way I can understand, because Jesus is going to help these people to move from a faith which is, I need Jesus to heal me, 
I want Jesus to do something for me. That's to say a faith based on my need and not a faith which would be, here is the Son of God and his words are important because his words are calling me to live a new form of life, a form of life where we love each other, a form of life which is calling me to be transformed. And as I say for myself, I can understand why Jesus did something to help people to move from this passage of a faith, I need Jesus, to Jesus needs me to bring peace to the world. What I am hearing here is a caring God. And I find that very beautiful the God of creation, who loves people, who loves all these men and women. He's come to give them a new message of love, which is a universal message, and he's concerned about their, about their welfare. We have to be concerned about our welfare. Do we eat well? Do we rest well? Do we create community together? Because that's what it's all about. What is touching is that we're going to discover that when everybody has eaten to their fill, Jesus says to the disciples, pick up everything that is left over and put it in baskets. And we discover that after they've picked everything up, the baskets are full to the brim. It's all this question which we saw in Cana, abundant love. And what does it mean to love abundantly? It's not a question of giving things, it's a giving oneself. We love abundantly when we give ourselves, when we give ourselves in trust, in faith, in, in belief, because I love you and I, I give myself to you. That is abundance. Everything when it's things, we measure things, but when we really love, we give abundantly. The people, obviously, uh, this huge crowd are terribly excited. Look what Jesus has done. We, we, we ought to have him and keep him and have him as our king. We'll be the king of Galilee and, and then we'll have enough food. Maybe we won't have to work. And, uh, and it says that Jesus slipped away. He went up into the mountain. Jesus doesn't want temple power. The whole thing and, and the, the story will unfold. Jesus doesn't want to be seen as the powerful king. He wants to be seen as a beloved friend. It's very different, very different. So Jesus slips away. The disciples are confused. People are all excited. They want to make Jesus king. Maybe they even feel that that's what should be done. But suddenly Jesus is out of the picture, he's gone. So they're confused, they don't know what to do. They sort of probably huddle together and say, well, what are we going to do? And because people also are coming to them and asking where Jesus is, and so they say, well, let's go to Capernaum. Capernaum was where the mother-in-law of Peter uh, lived and actually it was a sort of uh, headquarters for the, the disciples and for Jesus. And so they get into the boat and, and start rowing across the, across the lake. And of course night is coming and one of the things in the Lake of Galilee is it's surrounded by mountains and when the wind comes it just comes whistling down the mountains and within a few minutes the waves have become dangerous. And so they're struggling away and they're frightened. And suddenly Jesus is with them in the boat. And there's peace. This experience of crossing the lake is a passage of faith. And it's a passage of faith we all have to make. The disciples have to move from this excitement of we're going to be in the government with Jesus to something much humbler to discover that there's a mission that they have. But in order to accept this mission, somewhere they have to go through confusion. And maybe all of us in our passage of faith 
we have to go through confusion and anguish and we feel lost. This is all part of the journey. We have to go through a passage. And particularly because Jesus is going to reveal when eventually he comes to Capernaum something that's difficult to believe. And it's then going to take all the power of the Spirit so that the disciples don't just believe Jesus because he's winning, but because he's revealing something about love. Really, to understand this discourse of Jesus in Capernaum, which some of us, when we read, we might find difficulty with, I believe that we can't really understand it unless we see it under the light of the prologue. Before all things were, the Word was. And the Word was turned towards God, in presence to God, in the presence of God. And the Word became flesh and pitched his tent amongst us. You see, what Jesus wants is presence to people, presence to each person. It's a question of love. Jesus wants to enter into personal relationship with each person and then bring him through that personal relation, him or her, into the presence of the Father. So. It's going to be a difficult passage from the idea that everybody has of this huge, almighty God to the little God who made flesh, who became a little one, who needed a mother, who needed to be loved, who needed to be nourished, and a littleness. And what Jesus is going to do is to enter into a communion of hearts with people. That is a huge passage. There's a sort of a crushing from the admiration, the power to littleness. And to understand this passage, as I say, we have to see it in the light, as all the gospel, under the light of the prologue. The word who created all things becomes a little child. So let's come back to the actual discourse. Jesus has arrived and then people start arriving in their little boats and they ask Jesus, how did you get here? Jesus just says to them, you're looking for me because you've had your fill, because I've given you food, physical food from below. And then he goes on and he says, we must work not for the food that perishes, but the food that remains for eternal life, or the food that gives eternal life. So they say, well, well give us that, rather like the Samaritan woman who said, give us, give us the water, give us this water. But they still haven't understood. And Jesus looks at them and he says, I am the bread of life. The person who believes in me will never hunger. And the person who comes to me will, will never thirst. For the Hebrews, that's quite understandable because they have a deep, deep sense, the Hebrew people, of the Lord says, that's to say, the Word of God. That Word of God which nourishes the intelligence and nourishes the heart. You see, we human beings, we have an intelligence. And that intelligence is not just uh, to learn something, to do something, uh, to learn uh, electronics in order to build electronic things. We have an intelligence which needs the light, which needs to be fulfilled. Some of us are more questing. Some of us are more seeking the whole mystery of, of creation, because the greatest miracle of creation is creation. I mean, let's face it, the flowers, the lakes, the climate. Have you ever seen a baby in the womb of a mother? It's incredible. It's the little hands after a few days, and then this body that grows, and then that little body 
that comes out of the body of the mother and, and is seeking for love. I mean, is there any greater miracle than life? And there are great scientists who are finding all sorts of medication for this and that. But the story was in there, in them, before the intelligent people found them. I mean, we are built in an incredibly intelligent way, in an incredibly miraculous way. We human beings are a miracle of, of life and of love. For the Hebrew people, the word is bread. It's, it's food for my intelligence. Beautiful text of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel says, take this scroll and eat it. The scroll was the word of God. And the Ezekiel eats it, and he says it was as sweet as honey. But Jesus wants to lead them further from I am the bread of life and whoever believes in me uh, will never hunger and whoever comes to me will never thirst. He wants to bring them to presence. You see, the word can be something that comes and is for us all, but a presence is a presence to you. It's a friendship. And so Jesus will bring them further and this is where people will begin to get upset because he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And I give my flesh for the life of the world. So we're moving from the word to flesh. The word became flesh. So there's this movement. And then he goes on and says the incredible. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in that person. To try to understand that, Jesus is talking about the Word made flesh, his incarnated being, and he's yearning for a relationship person to person. And when he says to eat, he's saying, I want to be inside of you. You see, mutual indwelling, the one who eats my body, drinks my blood, that's mutual indwelling. That's what friendship is about. When we love somebody deeply, you live in me and I live in you. The Word became flesh in order to give life. That's the whole reality which is behind it. And so it's a question. We read the text, and these words were too hard, and people start turning away. I believe somewhere that what they're upset about is not just those words, but the transformation that is implied by those words, because if I eat Jesus and live in Jesus, it's a question of me being transformed in Jesus. And to love as Jesus loves, to be compassionate as Jesus is compassionate, to heal as Jesus heals, it means that I'm called to love the enemies. I mean, all that is impossible. But this is the promise. And people start leaving. And of course, if you love somebody deeply and they turn away, what happens? your heart is wounded. I believe there Jesus lived something very painful. He's offering a union of love which will transform humanity and bring peace to the world. But, but they, they can't, they don't believe, they, they, they all go away. These words are too hard. And then there's an incredible moment when Jesus looks at his disciples, do you too want to leave me? Every time I hear those words, I can almost hear the tears in the voice of Jesus. Because if he's saying that to the disciples, they are probably a little bit upset. Look, you're crazy talking about that. They're all leaving and we were going to win and we, you were going to be seen as the Messiah and we'd go to Jerusalem, we we're going to win. Now they're all leaving. And so you see with the disciples, they want to, they're upset with Jesus. And so those words, do you also want to leave me? 
We have there the Twelve. This is the first time it's talked of the Twelve. And Peter speaks out, Lord, to where shall, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I believe and I know that you are the Holy One of God. In a way, the disciples have the back against the wall. You see, Jesus has done two miracles for them. One was that exciting one when he fed everyone. The other was his presence as he appeared to them in the tempest. And so that second miracle called them in some way to announce faith, a faith. That the faith is not because Jesus does miracles. That's not it. It's not even because he's come and helped him in the water. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he loves us, wants us to enter into a deep relationship with him, and then to become like him, to be men and women of compassion in this world.